Hello, I'm Annette Young and welcome to the 51 percent show about women reshaping our world coming up. The horrific killing of a young woman by a serving London police officer prompts a national debate in the UK on the need to address femicide. Also, I'll be talking to French author and podcaster Charlotte Pudlowski on her book about incest that's creating much buzz here in France. And a Los Angeles court takes a major step towards ending the conservatorship of American pop idol Britney Spears in removing her father as overseer of not only her finances, but her personal life as well. But we begin in Britain where the murder of Sarah Everard six months ago prompted candlelit vigils and widespread calls to tackle violence against women and girls. That grief has now turned to rage as her killer, a serving London police officer, was sentenced to life behind bars. And Cressida Dick, the first female chief of the London Metropolitan Police, has also come under fire over the affair. Olivia salazar Winspear has more. Devastating, tragic and brutal. That's how the judge summed up the death of Sarah Everard, whose murder shocked the country and prompted serious questions about the conduct of the Met Police. I am absolutely horrified that this man used his position of trust to deceive and coerce Sarah. And I know you all are too. His actions were a gross betrayal of everything policing stands for. Her killer, Wayne Cousins, was given a rare life sentence at the Crown Court in London, with the judge highlighting his abuse of power as a significant factor, saying that this has very considerably added to the sense of insecurity that many have living in our cities, perhaps particularly women, when travelling by themselves and especially at night. Everard had been walking home in South London in March when she was approached by Cousins. He showed her his warrant card and arrested her for defying lockdown rules before kidnapping, raping and killing her. In the wake of his sentencing, the Met Police said they'll no longer deploy plainclothes officers on their own and issued guidelines for anyone being apprehended in the street. If somebody doesn't feel safe and they're not comfortable in the environment and they're dealing with a police officer, then ask them some questions. Where are you from? Why have you stopped me? Where are your colleagues? And that way they can start to feel safe. And if they really don't feel safe, they can dial 999. Earlier comments from Scotland Yard suggesting that women flag down a bus if they feel threatened have been called laughable by women's rights activists. Everard's high-profile case is one of dozens of femicides this year, a statistic highlighted by this front page of a daily newspaper. Amid accusations of failing to ensure women's safety on Britain's streets, there's now pressure on Met Police Commissioner Cressida Dick to step down as the head of the force. Now, here in France, the country is reeling from revelations that some 216,000 children have been sexually abused by members of the French Catholic clergy since 1950. An independent inquiry has warned that the number could indeed rise to more than 300,000 when abuse by lay members of the church is taken into account. The revelations coming just months after France faced a reckoning over incest. That followed a book by Camille Kushner, the daughter of a prominent French family, on how her twin brother was sexually abused by her stepfather. The publication sparking a Me Too incest hashtag, while a national poll discovered that one in ten French people have been victims of incest. And now the release of another book is also making waves in this country called uh, Upetet Unui, or in English, so maybe one night, podcaster and author Charlotte Pudlowski explores the subject after discovering at the age of 26 that her own mother had been the victim of incest. She joins me today in the studio. Charlotte, thank you so much for your time. So how did you discover about your mother's uh, history? I think it was in a very weird way, actually. We were just having dinner, my mother and father, my father and I, one night, and she had never mentioned it. She had never mentioned anything about her own father. And then, like, my father steps away from the table, he, and, and she's like, but you know my father. And I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And she's like, well, you know, since he tried to abuse me. And 
I had never heard of anything like that. But what felt really surprising wasn't really what had happened to her because you kind of always guess about family secrets. I knew that something had happened to her. I knew that something was missing in my personal history. But what was really weird for me was to realize that we are very close, my mother and I, and like the the five of us, my parents and my brother and my sister, were very close together. We talk a lot about like real subjects and our anxieties and stuff like that. And I realized that if even in my own family, one where people actually talk and love each other, we can't talk about that. Like, what was this silence about? And that's what I wanted to figure out. It was really a quest about her silence. When you read that here in France, that one in 10 people say that they're the victims of incest, it's shocking to hear, but incest is not just a problem in this country, but a problem right across the world, isn't it? Yeah, well, I think it, it shows, and it was part of my investigation, because at first I wondered, well, was it only my mother's story? And then I realised it is very frequent, but it's not hazard, you know, it's not by chance. It's actually a domination system. It's actually what patriarchy means. We hear a lot about this word, uh, like we've been hearing it a lot for the, the past few years, but we don't always realise, like, the root of the word is actually the word father, pater, you know, and it's actually the same word that we use in the Catholic Church when we talk about like a father, you know, and the problem is actually the, the social system we live in that is built on one man, it could be the father, it can be the grandfather, it could be the priest, it could be anyone, but it's always a man who has authority uh, on other people's uh, lives and bodies. And ownership rights. Exactly, exactly. It seems authorities here, however, are very slowly waking up to the fact that this is a widespread problem. I mean, it was only in September that a hotline was established for victims of incest. So do you think uh, the government and uh, authorities here are doing enough to address the issue? I think the, like, the core problem, and we can see it with what's happening within the church uh, right now, it's that we separate problems, we separate issues as if it wasn't like a structural problem. So we say there's a problem with like children victims of incest. So we're going to put a line and they will be able to talk. And then uh, we are strengthening the, the way we're going to repress uh, the violence. But nothing is made to stop children from actually being raped. You know, there is no prevention and that's the whole issue. People who have to be made aware of it are like politicians and they're actually at the heart of the power. So I think it's for them that it's the hardest to understand what it actually means to change the domination system we live in. Charlotte, thank you so much for coming in. Thank you. Now, the saga of American pop idol Britney Spears has taken a new turn, a Los Angeles judge having suspended her father from the conservatorship that controlled the singer's life and money for 13 years. Her father having been the overseer of not only the pop star's $60 million fortune, but also the most intimate details of her personal life. Brian Quinn reports. Outside this Los Angeles courthouse, an explosion of joy as a judge suspends the father of Britney Spears from the head of her 13-year conservatorship. Since June, the singer has been struggling to free herself from the legal arrangement that saw her father, Jamie, take an extreme level of control over her finances, career, and even intimate personal life. Jamie Spears and others are going to face even more serious ramifications for his misconduct. Putting a listening device under Britney Spears' bed in her bedroom, something that's very, very troubling. In 2008, Jamie Spears petitioned the courts for control of Britney's life and finances on grounds of drug abuse and mental health problems. Since then, he's been the sole decision maker for his daughter, even preventing her from having a contraceptive device removed. Though his grip is now broken, Brittany remains under conservatorship with an accountant put in temporary charge over her finances. 
For the singer's die-hard fans, the B Army, the latest decision is a long-awaited victory, but not the end of the fight. Even when she's free, it's not over because B Army is going to make sure that the 1.5 million people that are in conservatorships are also free. And we're going to amplify the voices of all of the other people who have been exploited and abused in this system. Jamie Spears denies any illegal surveillance. He recently argued for the conservatorship to be dissolved altogether. Britney's lawyers, though, say that's just a ploy to avoid handing over potentially incriminating records. The judge has set a hearing in November to consider officially terminating the arrangement, with another in December to resolve outstanding financial issues, including a million dollars in legal fees that the conservatorship has billed to Britney's estate. And that's it for now. You can also connect with us via our Facebook page, that of course being France 24.51%, or do send us a tweet at underscore 51%. So until our next show, bye for now.